of you have trials in your life? Right? We do, don't we? We have trials, we have difficulties, we have hard times. And this is exactly what David was going through when he wrote this psalm. So turn with me to Psalm 139. You know, the Jewish teachers felt that this psalm was one of the greatest psalms that David ever wrote. And so I want us to look a little bit in depth to this psalm because David was going through a hard time. It seems like David always had enemies, didn't he? And you know what? We do too. We have the enemy of fear. We have the enemy of worry. We have the enemy of anxiety. We have the enemy of pride. We have the enemy of discouragement. All these enemies may not be a physical person. They may be a physical person that brings that into our life. But we all have these things that we're faced with. And just as Gail said earlier, what are we going to do? Who are we going to turn to? Where are we going to go? There are a lot of places we can run to when we're in trouble. We can run to TV. We can run Hallmark movies. You know, I love Hallmark movies. <laughs> you know, I go to church and I get all fired up to serve the Lord and put God first. And I go home and Hallmark movies on. <laughs> We can turn to all kinds of things. We can turn to other people. But who is really the source of comfort and strength and peace and joy? He is. And that's what David knew so well. Now, if you look at Psalm 139 and you look over at uh, verses 19 through 22, you'll see that David is saying he's going through a hard time. He says, oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. They speak against God wickedly. We see that a lot in our world today, don't we? Men that speak against God, they don't think anything about it. And this is what David was facing. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Enemies all around. But what does David do consistently in his life when he's facing these things? He turns to God. And this psalm is David speaking to himself of who God is. He's an awesome God. He's a mighty God. If you look back over at the first part of this psalm, he says, oh, Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You know all about me, God. You are God who knows everything. Omniscient God. I love this. You know my sitting down and my rising up. And some of us sit more than we rise. And he knows all about it, right? He knows all about it. You understand my thought afar off. Isn't that incredible that God understands your thoughts? Wow. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You see, the psalmist is reminding himself God is truly in control and he knows everything about me. He knows everything about my life. He knows everything that I'm going through. And because he knows all of these things, I can trust him. I know that he's there for me, just like Gail shared earlier. Our God is an awesome God, and we can trust in him. He says, for there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Hey, haven't you wished sometime that God, knowing those words before they came out, had stopped them? Right? Oh, God, why didn't you put a, a leash on my tongue? So many times we say things and we regret it. And look at this one. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Oh, my goodness. Think about that. You've hedged me behind. You've hedged me before. God is all around watching over us, taking care of us. He's with us. He'll never forsake us. You know, my aunt used to wear this girdle. And this girdle had bones in it. Let me tell you one thing. It was from here 
probably up here, all the way down. And it kept her prim and proper, let me tell you. We should all have some of those whale bones holding us up. I'll never forget, we went camping one time, and she typically would take her uh, girdle off at night, and she took it off and hung it in a tree, because we were camping. <laughs> and the next morning, we saw trash cans dumped over and realized some bears had come into the camp. And I remember my Auntie Mae said, oh my goodness, I hope they didn't get my girdle. <laughs> well, I don't think the bears wanted her girdle. But I always think about that. It's like he's all around us. He's holding us up, right? When you feel like, oh, I'm so weak, I'm like jelly. Hey, he's holding you up. He's right there. And I also love this where it says, he laid his hand upon me. Oh, isn't that awesome? I'll never forget my first date with my husband. He was a football player from Mississippi State. He'd be quick to tell you that. He loved playing for Mississippi State. That's all he wears, Mississippi State clothes. My daughter sends them to him, and he loves it. But anyway, he asked me out on a date. Boy, I thought I was in high cotton. This big old football player asking me to go out. And I'll never forget our first date. He was wearing a suit, and we went to a play at his high school. And I'll never forget as we were walking, he took his hand and he put it on my back. And he was just kind of guiding me along the way. And, oh, I just felt so secure that if anything came, a truck, whoo, he'd just swoop me up, <laughs> protect me. That was an awesome feeling. God's hand, look at this, laid your hand upon me. Listen, think of the hand of God. Whoo, what a span that hand has. His hand is laid upon you. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. And in our vernacular, he said, it blows my mind. It does. Have you ever seen that mojo? Mojo, is that how you say that? Moji? Moji, okay. <laughs> mojo, moji, whatever. I, I'm like Gail, we're relics. We don't know how to say stuff. Have you seen that one that blows your mind? Have you seen that? His head's coming up and it's got smoke coming out. I love that one. That's a good one. <laughs> Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. You see, when we're going through a hard time, this is what we need to do. We need to turn back to our God and remember who he is. Remember, oh God, you know everything. You know what I'm going through. You know, so many times people can't understand what you're going through. Especially husbands. They don't get it. We're a confusion to them. And God gave my husband five daughters. The man is so confused. Constant confusion. I don't understand me, and he surely doesn't understand me. God wanted him to die to himself a whole lot. But God understands us. He knows all about us. You know, people go to psychiatrists and what do they want you to do? Tell your story. Tell everything. Well, we don't have to even tell God. He already knows. He knows. He knows your name. Isn't that awesome? He has it written on his hand. Our God. Our omniscient God. And then he goes on and he reminds himself, oh, God is everywhere. He talks about where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I'm in hell. Now, that doesn't literally mean in hell, but when we feel like we're in hell, have you ever felt that way? Yes, ma'am. I have. Menopause will do that to you. But when you... <laughs> yeah. I've been there too. <laughs> Done that. Hallelujah. Gone through that. No matter what, he's with us. He says, verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me. Wow. Your right hand shall hold me. It almost makes me want to cry. He's not just leading us. He's holding us. And there's so many times in life when you just want to be held. You know, my mom and dad and sister were killed in a plane crash when I was 22 years old. And there have been so many times throughout life, I just wanted my mama. You know how that is? I just want my mama. I want my mama to hold me. I didn't have that, but I have always had God. And let me tell you, he's an awesome holder. He holds us. He leads us. He guides us. 
That's the most awesome knowledge that we can have. And here's the psalmist saying, I'm going through these troubled waters, but oh God, you're with me. You're holding me. You know me. Even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. I shall, if I say, surely the darkness shall follow me. You know, so many times we can think, oh, what, what's going to happen next? It's going to be so bad. Have you ever lived in the what ifs? What if this or what if that? And God says, don't worry about that. I'm with you. No matter what comes, I'm with you. I'll never leave you. Even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. That doesn't scare God one bit. He knows all about it. He's the one who separated the darkness from the light. And he can bring light into every situation. I'll never forget, my dad was a pilot, and one time we were coming into this city, and in Brazil, that's where my parents were missionaries, in Brazil you had to land that plane before dark because the airstrips didn't have lights. And I will never forget, we hit a storm, and our plane was coming into this town, and it was dark. And my dad went, he saw lights on in one of the hangars, and he took the plane, and he kind of went low, and he made a sound. Ugh, ugh. That's to indicate there's a plane here that needs to land. Because usually somebody would take a car and take their car and park it where the runway was and make light with their, their headlights and you could land. But nobody heard his call. There was a little boy who lived near the airport and he had a bicycle light. He had it on the front of his bicycle and he heard the plane and he saw that no one was running to help. So he took his little bicycle and he put it on the runway and my daddy landed the airplane by the light of that bicycle. Listen, God brings even a little tiny light in the darkness and it shines bright. You, Jesus through you, can be that little bicycle light. You see, we think, oh, how can God use me? I'm nobody, I'm nothing. And he says, oh, what did we just read in 1 Peter? You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. Isn't that awesome? And what are we here for? To proclaim the excellencies of him who brought us out of darkness into light. That's who our God is. And that's who we can be in others' lives. Just to proclaim that he has done that in my life. And I can share with you who he is to be a light in your life. Okay, so he goes on and he comes to our verse uh, 13 and 14. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. Listen, God knew you when your mother didn't even know you were there. When you were being formed, when you were being knit together, when God was literally putting you together, giving you that nose, giving you those eyes, giving you that hair, giving you that DNA, giving you all these things. He's the one that put us all together. Isn't that incredible? And God has a sense of humor. Sometimes he gives us a big nose. All the more to blow. I told somebody a minute ago, look at our feet. God really has a sense of humor. <laughs> feet are funny looking, aren't they? <laughs> but he put us together. You formed my inward parts. You know, it's a sad thing because so many times girls will look in the mirror and they only see, oh, I'm so ugly. I'm so this or I'm so that. But we're made beautiful. He made us all beautiful. He did. He's so creative. I mean, how could God think up so many different faces? It's incredible. Can you imagine him? Ooh, I'm going to give her this nose, and I think she needs some big ears there. She can hear better. <laughs> you know, he, he put us all together. And then he says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. You see, the psalmist is reminding himself of who God is and what God has done in his life. Even the intricacies of our bodies, like Gail said, 
We don't have to stop and think to breathe, do we? Most times we don't. We don't have to stop and think to blink. What if your eyes didn't blink? What if they just stayed open? Boy, you'd be up a creek without a paddle. Your eyes would be jumping out of your eyeballs, jumping out of your head. God made it function perfectly. Now, my husband teaches Hebrew. So I said, I want you to uh, go back and tell me exactly what it says in the Hebrew. And this is kind of the, the amplified version. And this is what it starts out when he says, I will praise you. It literally means, I will choose to praise you. Do you realize we have a choice? I can praise God. Or I can look to myself. I can be angry at God. I have been angry at God. I was angry one time with God because um, my husband had been called to Costa Mesa. And we were living in Pasadena and our house hadn't sold. And we went from August until February and our house didn't sell. And every Sunday we'd go down to Costa Mesa. And I'd be in the, kit, in the car with all these kids for three services. Oh, it was so much fun. <laughs> And I told God one day, I am mad at you. What is wrong? Why aren't you moving things? Why hasn't my house sold? Why? You know, all these things. And the Lord, man, God is so smart. Let me tell you what he did. He, I, I got so mad, I took my Bible and I just went, nah. I'm going to open my Bible. Nah, nah, nah. Well, I didn't flip through. I opened it and you know what it fell? It fell to this right here. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And look what it says. The end of a thing is better than its beginning. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. God had just called me a fool. Oh, my word. Now, is that getting direct knowledge from the Lord? Man, oh, man. And then he said, do not say why were the former days better than these? That's exactly what I was saying. God, I don't understand. You brought me out to California, and now you forgot about me. What a lie. And then it says in verse 11, Consider the work of God, for who can make straight what he has made crooked? For in the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider. Surely God has appointed the one as well as the other. So the psalmist is saying, I choose to praise. I choose to praise you, to thank you, because by astonishingly great, stupendous, unique ways, all aspects of my being have been remarkably made. I love where the fearfully, I look fearfully up. It says carefully reverently made. You weren't just thrown together. God thought about it. He put you together as he planned. I think of the potter with the clay. We look at that lump of clay. How is that going to be anything? But the potter knows in his mind what he's making, what he's creating. You are wonderfully made, distinguished from others, different, set apart. You're unique. You're manifested, this is what the psalmist is saying, your manifested works are remarkable. And my inner man continually knows this without any uncertainty at all. Wow. I choose to praise you. He's meditating on who God is. His omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence. Oh, his crea God creator who created me, who formed me in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, this is one of the greatest verses, it's verse 16, the last part. And in your book, they all were written the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. That was a verse that comforted me greatly when my parents and sister were killed. God, you knew the days they would live. You said, you have this number of days, 
And then I want you to come home. God knows how many days we all will live. I want those days, like Gail said, to be lived for Jesus. The few days I may have left, Lord, may I choose to praise you. May I choose to exalt you. May I choose to let my life be a light to others. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would more in, be more in number than the sand. Oh, my goodness. I want you to go down to Huntington Beach and get a bucket of sand, and then I want you to count the grains in the bucket. You'll be doing that for the next 10 years. And he's saying here, God's thoughts toward us would outnumber the sand. That's incredible. Wow. We think we're the ones thinking about God. No. He's thinking about us. How precious he is. He knows everything about him, us. David rehearsed to himself these truths about God. And what is the result in his life? Number one, complete trust in God's love and care for him. Do I trust in him? Do I trust in his love for me? That's where the enemy attacks us. Gail talked about that battle, that incessant battle. It's not, it might come, it's, we're in the battle constantly. And one of the ways I believe the enemy attacks us is, does God really love you? Does God really care about me? It's a lie from the pit. That's exactly what I was feeling that time in Pasadena. Does God really care? He's forgotten about me. He left me in Pasadena. Don't want to be left in Pasadena. But he does care. He knows all about it. Do I trust his love? Ask yourself that today. Number two, trusting that God can guide my life and take care of my enemies. Take care of my fears. Take care of my anxieties. Take care of my worries. Take care of people who affect me in a detrimental way. He knows my anxieties. He knows my fears. And he's able to lead me in a way everlasting. He's so faithful. Yeah, I want you to look at two, two passages. One real quick. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And this is a time when David was facing... His own men, his men were kind of ruthless guys that he had as, as his gang. And what had happened is they had gone to fight a battle, and when they were gone, the enemy came and stole their wives and their children. And when they came back, the men were so distraught, they blamed David. You know, we're all about blaming somebody, aren't we? Always looking somebody to blame. And they blamed David. They blamed David so much they wanted to stone him. And in uh, 1 Samuel chapter um, 30... It says in verse 6, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. I'd be distressed if people wanted to stone me. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David, what did he do? David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. This is the thing. Are you going to choose to strengthen yourself in God? Or choose to go my way, do my thing, put a substitute in there, put a Band-Aid on it, instead of going to the source who can do anything about it, trusting in him. That's the bottom line for us. Do we trust him? And then I want you to look over at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles 20. And this is, this is the guy named Jehoshaphat. I'm so thankful my parents didn't put that in my name. Jania Fat, I would not have liked that. Anyway, <laughs> this is Jehoshaphat. And chapter 20, verse 3, it says this. Well, what happened? All these people from Moab, people of Ammon, the people, uh, the Ammonites and the, all these ites came against him. And verse 3, it says this. And Jehoshaphat feared... But what did he do with the fear? He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And they gathered together to ask God for help. And from the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. 
And he cried out in verse 6, O oh Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? He's doing the same thing that David did in Psalm 139. He's reminding himself of who God is. This is powerful God. This is mighty God. These multitudes coming against me. Hey, God can take care of it. In your life, the multitudes coming against you that make you fear, that make you not trust. God's saying, will you trust me? I am able. I have a little, we had a retreat one time. I think it was a pastor's wives retreat. And they gave us little cards that said, he is able. He is able. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything we can imagine. You know, I have a daughter who's a missionary in Belgium. And she and her husband have been uh, given uh, an opportunity to come here to the States. And he's going to be um, on staff at a church, a Calvary Chapel. And they applied to come because he's from Belgium, so he needed to get a, a green card to come. They applied a, a year ago. And it keeps dragging on and dragging on and dragging on. And uh, they can't buy their tickets to come until they go to the embassy and get the okay and get his green card and all of that. And it's very frustrating. They have two little kids, two years old and nine months. And it's just, you know, we want to sell our car, but we don't want to sell our car. We still need our car. We want to get rid of our apartment, but we don't want to. It's just back and forth and up and down. And one day I was reading this passage because, you see, the anxieties of my daughter, I feel them too. Huh, mamas? Grandmamas? Mm-hmm. Y'all feel that? I do. I feel that turmoil. And it was just like God said, Janie, are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust me right here? All these multitudes coming against you. Are you going to trust me? And I want to be like Jehoshaphat. I want to be like David. I want to say, yes, Lord, I trust you. Are you, verse 7, are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? Stones of remembrance. Remember who God is. Remember what he's done in your life. Remember how he saved you, how he brought you out of darkness into light. Remember his faithfulness time and time and time again. And then as you remember, hold on to it. God, you haven't changed. You're still going to be faithful. You're still going to get me through, no matter how difficult. And then it says, verse um, 12, Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude. You don't have power of, about things in your life, do you? Sometimes things are overwhelming. And I love that scripture. It says, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That rock is Jesus, trusting in him. God, I can trust you. I'm in the palm of your hand. Your hands are around me. You're holding me. <coughs> You're going to get me through. And then I love verse 17. God's reply. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And he wants to say that today to us. I am with you. I am with you. You don't have to fear. You can have that joy. That joy no matter what the circumstances are. He can fill us with his joy overflowing. Um, rejoicing that God is in control of my life. I can have peace. I can have peace in my conscience. I love it in Philippians 4 where it says, take everything, bring everything to him, every little thing, every big thing, bring it all to him. And he says, as we do that in prayer, his peace that passes all understanding will reign in our hearts. We can even have patience. Do you know he allows you to go through these trials? Why? Because he's doing a work in you, Romans 5. You start reading that list. He says, be thankful for these tribulations. Rejoice in these tribulations. Why? Because God's producing things in you as you go through them. He's producing endurance. He's producing patience. He's producing proven character, which is the character of God, the fruit of the Spirit. He's producing hope. He's producing love. All of these things he's doing as we go through these trials, as we learn to trust him. We weren't put here to be remembered but to be prepared for eternity. Did you know that? God has no trivial plan. 
He's not seeking to make us, um, hold on, comfortable, but to make us eternal. Isn't that what he's all about? He's preparing you for eternity. I love that. What am I made for? I'm here to glorify God and enjoy him. Revelation 4.11 says this, You are worthy, O our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. By your will they existed and were created for your pleasure. We were created for God's pleasure, to bring glory to him. And ladies, when we trust him, that brings glory to him. That brings glory to him. He has justified us. He has sanctified us. Justification, just as if I never sinned. He removes that sin from us when we come to Jesus. He, we are covered now in the robes of righteousness from Jesus himself because of the price he paid for our sins. We're, we're sanctified. In other words, once you get saved, then you just start growing. God grows you in holiness. He sets you apart to cause you to grow. He does that many times through discipline. The work of justification, the work of sanctification. The moment we set, accept Jesus, I love this little saying, listen to this, the moment we accept Jesus, we're saved from the penalty of sin. Penalty. The work of sanctification, we are saved from the power of sin. Saved from the penalty, saved from the power. Listen to the last one. In the future, we'll be saved from the presence of sin. Hey, honey, I can't wait for that day. I can't wait when sin has no more rule over me. Woo-hoo! That's when you're dead, okay? And that's called glorification. So justification removes the penalty. Sanctification removes the power. And glorification removes the presence of sin. We praise what we value. And in this psalm, David valued who God is. Because he could look to God and God's omniscience, God's omnipresence, God's omnipotence. He could look to God and know he was trusting in someone who could make a difference, someone who could change all things. But even if he didn't, I love that where Peter said, oh, where can we go? Only you have the words of life. And isn't it true? Oh, that we would turn to him. Oh, that we would keep our eyes on him. Oh, that we would remember who he is when we're facing things in our life. That will bring glory to his name. <laughs>